Coming up next on Executive Caters Corporate Club at Landerhaven, Fox 8 Sports Director John Telich interviews Terry Pluto of The Plain Dealer and legendary voice of the Cavs Joe Tate about Tate's broadcast career with the Cleveland Cavaliers and the Cleveland Indians. They'll discuss the miracle of Richfield, Tate's relationship with Ted Stepien, Dan Gilbert, LeBron James, as well as a look at the 2012 Cavs team. From the Grand Ballroom at Executive Caterers at Landerhaven, thank you for joining us as we celebrate more than 20 years of presenting important and timely discussions. Corporate Club is the direct link for community leaders to connect with regional businesses, government, and nonprofit organizations. This series of programs deals with those issues and persons that impact on the lives of those who live in Northeastern Ohio. Corporate Club at Landerhaven begins right now. Well, welcome everybody to John Tellich from Fox 8. I'm going to kind of moderate our discussion with Hall of Fame broadcaster Joe Tate. <laughs> Who was there when Dr. Naismith hung the peach basket? Yes? No? That's right. <laughs> and Terry Pluter from The Plain Dealer, prolific writer. He'll be writing a book as we speak. <laughs> And that will be due out after lunch, right? Right, and Joe will be signing copies out there for the next two years, so hopefully uh, we'll be able to retire when it's all done, because you are retired. I am retired, yes, I am. And how has retirement been for you? I love it. What, what have you been doing? Uh, I fixed the vacuum cleaner. Uh, the other <laughs> Have, uh, we this have was now, a new vacuum cleaner. Yeah, brand new vacuum. Well, uh, we could speak to the store about that, but we'll, we'll okay. Well, you have to put all the pieces together. Oh, I see. Comes in a box. Then I'm not buying it. Yeah. I get a vacuum cleaner. It's got to be running. What else have you been doing? Have you uh, been watching the basketball team? No. You have not. No. Any interest in doing that? No. You just want to get away as best as you can. Yes. Well, that takes care of this interview. <laughs> Terry, what can we do to get this guy engaged with what's going on right now? The, when we were doing the book, one of the interesting things that came out of that was Joe liked doing the broadcast. In fact, I often say I like sports, but I love to write. I mean, the thing that really gets me excited is putting together the story. For Joe, it was putting together the broadcast and doing all that, even if, like, what was annoying him on the floor. Well, Joe sometimes would make it very clear that things were annoying him on the floor. But I, I, so I'm not that surprised that after the ball stopped bouncing for him, he hasn't picked it up again. Although I know, for example, we talk about some small colleges, some high school teams, that kind of stuff. I think that still interests him. Well, you know something, Joe? Uh, I understand that we may have breaking news to talk about. You might actually be behind the mic again soon. That's right. I uh, have a friend, Tim Alcorn, who's the. Yep. Uh, announcer at uh, WEOL in Elyria, and last year I was supposed to do a high school game for him, and of course the microphone didn't reach all the way to the 18th floor at Cleveland Clinic, so Tough to do. I had to bow out. But I told him, I said, I will, I will make it up to you. Uh, uh, I'll make good, as we say in the right. broadcast biz. And uh, so uh, the last Friday, the 27th of this month, uh, I am going to do a high school basketball game for WEOL in Elyria, and uh, he was nice enough to make it a ball game I could walk to if I had to. <laughs> it's uh, Keystone at Columbia, so right. it's right in the neighborhood. And uh, folks that are not familiar, Joe has been for years, uh, been doing the Purple Raiders of uh, Mount Union. That's been a real labor of love, hasn't that been for it you, Joe? It is indeed a labor of love. I've just completed 26 years with the Purple Raiders, and uh, that's a press box they're going to have to drag me out of kicking and screaming because... Uh, I really enjoy it. That's sports for sports' sake, and you don't find a lot of that around anymore. No, you don't. Uh, let's get back to the book. How tough was it to, to write? Did, did, did Joe come over and, and discuss parts of his life, or did he just say, here's some stuff, write a book? Oh, I, I interviewed him, I don't know, 15, 20 times, but the thing about Joe Tate, I'm sure all of us have scrapbooks of our entire life. He had 15 different scrapbooks. Do you have your third grade report card? 
he did in the scrapbook. <laughs> and he also had things like his rejection letters from different jobs. You know, they still won't hire him in Rockford. He kept getting <laughs> his rejection letters from Rockford and from other places. Um, and so the, it really was like opening up this whole, um, it was a gold mine for a writer. And he kept all the, I keep like good copies of good reviews of my books and kind of try not to get rid of the bad. He had them all in there, people that couldn't stand him. You know, Bob Dolgan really loved your baseball, you know, on baseball announcing these kind of, he had all the bad reviews in there along with the good ones. And so for me, it was pretty easy to kind of put it all together and then ask Joe about the different things. Um, one of the most interesting, where Joe mentioned doing high school games. Joe, how many high school games do you think you did in your life? Oh, boy, I would have, I would have no way of knowing. I just thousands. I did 3,670 Cavalier and Rockers games, and uh, probably double that, maybe triple that in, in high school ball yeah. over 55, 56 years. And yet, doing all of those games on the high school level, gave you some sort of confidence at that stage 40-some years ago when there was an opening to become the broadcaster for the Cavaliers. What, inside, you know, what worked for you to be able to get that job? Was it just a young guy being brash and saying, try me, give me the, my, my opportunity? No, it was me uh, writing a letter to uh, Bill Fitch, who was the first coach, and uh, telling him that if uh, he ever needed anybody to do for the Cavaliers, what I used to do for the Monmouth College Fighting Scots, which, by the way, was the worst football team ever seen on the planet. Uh, and he used to just, he coached for Co in basketball, but scouted in football. And he used to tell me, I have never heard anybody make a 66 to nothing blowout sound like a 6 6 tie. And uh, so. I saw in the agate type, I was working in Terre Haute, Indiana, and I saw in the agate type that he had been named the first Cavs coach. So I sent him a note, wished him well, and down at the bottom I just put P.S. You ever need somebody to do for the Cavaliers? What I used to do for those fighting Scots of Monmouth, parentheses, 66 to nothing, let me know. <laughs> uh, sent the note and, and completely forgot about it. And then the phone rang and it was Bill and he said, if, uh, if you're interested, you can come to Cleveland uh, two nights from now, uh, audition for Nick Maletti, and if he likes you, he'll hire you. And so I drove to Cleveland and uh, uh, climbed up to that old hockey press box at the end of the Cleveland arena, did the game on a tape recorder up there, gave the tape to Bob Brown, who was the first voice of the Cavaliers, and uh, the next, I went across the street to the Midtown Sheraton, and. Uh, Spent the night, and the next morning, uh, Bob called and said, be in Nick's office in 30 minutes, and uh, Nick said he liked what I did, hired me, and that was that. And what was that first year like? I mean, it was absolutely horrible basketball, but we kind of expected that. It was, in a way, it was probably like being a war correspondent uh, assigned to uh, Custer on the way <laughs> to the Little Bighorn. <laughs> Not looking good so far. I spent most of the time wondering where the heck did all those Indians come from? But uh, yeah, I, I can remember, uh, just case in point, we were delayed by snow getting back into Cleveland from Chicago, and the Lakers were due to come in and play us that night. And when they said we were going to be circling around uh, Hopkins for a while till uh, they get a uh, uh, snow grader, off the runway. It's right now blocking the runway. So Fitch uh, called the stewardess over and said, uh, ask the pilot to check and see if the Lakers made it in. And she did, and he sent the message back. Yeah, the Lakers got in about an hour ago. And Fitch turned to me and he says, another loss. <laughs> Which he said so many times over, over the years. You know, John, the, uh, while I was researching the book and doing this, and I'm, I grew up listening to Joe, and so, yeah. you know, Joe was not even born in 1970 when he got that job, but seriously, I, I, you know, I was really into the Cavs. But they would never put together a franchise now like they did back then. There was, first of all, no, Nick Maletti had no money, and he got the team simply because that was back when the ABA was around. And that year, the NBA not only added Cleveland, but they added Portland and Buffalo. They added, it was like this rush to, 
put teams in cities for the NBA to get there before the ABA did. So Nick Valetti was breathing, he had a building, he got a team. And then you turn around, I mean think about this, can you imagine Byron Scott would be the guy hiring the, hiring the broadcast to replace Joe? But here was, the front yeah. office was so small that the head coach had his fingers on who was going to be the uh, next broadcaster. Then again, the head coach also and his assistant, Jim Lessig, they went out and bought a bunch of basketball cards right before the expansion draft so they could look at the back of the cards and see the stats of the guys that they were picking the expansion draft. <laughs> This is the old, you don't make it up, it sounds Terry, no mock drafts? <laughs> that, that was, really, in fact, I think it was Jimmy Lessig who was uh, the assistant. His son came home with these basketball cards. He's looking at them. He goes, those are pretty cool. And he calls up Fitch. He goes, there's no, no internet. There's nothing. Here's all these stats. And I actually, I called Fitch and, and, and did talk to him for the book. And I said, well, did you, uh, uh, what about that tape that Joe did from the hockey press box? Did you listen to it? He goes, no, nah, I didn't listen to it. And he said, look, I knew he had the job as long as he's willing to take the money, which what was. Money? That was How money? much did you make? <laughs> what did you make that year? I made $100 a game for the 74 games that were to be broadcast uh, the rest of the season, which means I took a, a, a cut from $10,000 in Terre Haute to $7,400 in Cleveland. But uh, he did promise me, Nick promised me, that someday he'd make it up to me. And when he uh, again waved the magic wand and bought the Indians, uh, he called me up and he said, uh, I told you I'd make it up to you. You're now the play-by-play -play guy with Herb score for the Indians. The 1970s. Yep. Well, talk about that. The, you know, you're doing the basketball. The team really wasn't that good until the Miracle Grove Richfield years. And then you're doing the Indians. They had their difficult times. We can say that quite a bit. So what was that like? Well, it was uh, a little hectic, although because the Indians never made the playoffs and the Cavaliers never made the playoffs, there were no overlaps. So I could just go from the end of one season to the start of the next. Uh, and in, at the same time, I was doing the Cleveland Barons in the old American Hockey League, and uh, they did make the playoffs. And so I was doing a lot, hopping back and forth between the Barons, but they were all on WERE, and uh, so it was just a question of, which game they decided to broadcast as to where I would be on, uh, you know, that particular evening. So it was a lot of crazy travel, but it, uh, you know, I was young and foolish. I, in 1974, I had nine days in which I was either not going to, coming from, or doing a ball game. So uh, it was hectic, but it was, it was fun. It really was fun. It was an entirely different atmosphere to professional sports in those days as opposed to today. Wow. John, uh, when we were doing the book too, the thing about the 70s that I think really helped Joe in so many ways, number one, Joe didn't replace anybody as a broadcaster. I remember when Casey Coleman yeah. took over for Nev Chandler, the late Nev. Nev Chandler, he said, you know, boy, who wants to take over for Nev? I mean, Nev was a legendary guy. So basically, Joe came in here and defined how basketball was done on the radio. And then secondly, in the 1970s, there were hardly any games on TV. So if you were a Cavs fan, Joe was, and you weren't at the game, Joe was your eyes. He was your voice telling you that. And so that's, I think, when, when we began to do the book and I asked readers to send in emails about Joe, that was what they talked about. Joe, how many of those like Miracle Richfield games are even on TV? Uh, the, the Bullets, Washington Bullets, had uh, two or three three on with Sonny Jurgensen, the uh, Sonny former <laughs> NFL quarterback, as the analyst, <laughs> and uh, we had none. We had none. So everybody, basically, you listened to the games, and that was the fun part of doing the radio, too, just uh, doing the book, rather. It almost became a, a, a bit of a history of Cleveland radio, and just like, I mean, Joe was coming up at the same time Pete Franklin, you know, took over and basically invented sports talk. I think not only here, but probably around the country. Your favorite thing is sports talk, isn't it? Oh, I, oh, knew we were I work, loved every I, moment gonna, of it. We're yeah. going to dwarf into this thing. <laughs> no, go right ahead, Joe. I mean, sports talk radio has become so big, but as, as Terry mentioned, uh, Pete Franklin, those of us that have followed sports in, in Cleveland for all these years, know the history of sports talk and where Pete is with that. Now it is so over the top. There's so much out there. What was it like back then, and do you think 
in your second career you could ever come back as a sports talk show host? No, <laughs> uh, and would not want to. I figured. I'd rather be on the back of one of those garbage trucks. Well, that would qualify you for being on a sports talk show, come to think of it. <laughs> uh, Let it out, Joe. That, uh, <laughs> no, that's, I, that was one. You did, you did this in the 70s. One fatal didn't you? mistake I made was agreeing to uh, fill in for Pete Franklin when Pete had oral surgery and couldn't do his show for a month. I filled in, but back in those days, I did it because I needed the money. And uh, so uh, I was on the air one night and some fan called in and wanted to know if I were the general manager of the Cleveland Indians, what would I do about manager Frank Robinson? And this was getting into Robbie's second season. And I said, well, if I was the general manager, I never would have brought him back for a second season anyway. I would have fired him at the end of the first season. But I also said, but now that we're into the second season and the team obviously isn't going anywhere, you might as well let him stay here and continue to learn how to be a manager. Well, the newspapers got a hold of it, and it was, uh, I, if I were general manager, I'd fire Frank Robinson. None of the rest of the stuff got in there. And uh, I remember, who was it, Lou Darvis? Was that the name of the cartoonist? Uh, who had a great picture, a cartoon of Robbie on the front sports page with a big Indian's hat, and there was an arrow going through one side of the hat labeled Tate, and an <laughs> arrow going through the other side labeled Cardi, because Rico Cardi had just worked him over too. And, uh, yeah, those were in the scrapbooks. Well, and the problem was that, see, Joe was the radio voice of the Indians. And so he got to see Frank right after he said that. And that's, Every day. That Every was, day. that's why that became such a big story, not that some guy on talk radio wants somebody fired or whatever, but very rarely. I mean, I don't think you really hear a whole lot of play-by-play -play guys now. In fact, it's probably the last time you talked about firing a coach. Well, no, there was one other one. Yes. <laughs> yeah. But uh, that is he tra is he changing the subject on us or is he? I, I one thing about Frank Robinson, <laughs> Frank and uh, Bob Sudik, Hank Kozlowski, and I played tennis together on the road. I know you look at me today and say, "Oh, come on!" But <laughs> back in those days, when I was in my fighting trim. We played tennis together on the road, and so uh, Sudik went to Robbie after this big brouhaha and said, uh, uh, Frank, uh, you still want to play tennis? With, you know, Joe will be included if, if you want to play. And he says, I'll play against him, but I won't play with him. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and, and, and Sudik kept saying, I know he's going to hit one across the net at about 190 miles an hour. He never did, though. He never did. And uh, uh, Dwayne Kuyper told me later that Frank actually did evolve into a decent manager when uh, Kuyper was out there with him in San Francisco. Well, uh, you were there for that historic day. He, you know, hits the home run, yeah. player manager. What was that like? That, that was certainly well, one the, of the bigger moments. The stadium sport. was filled, which was a rarity. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, he hit it off Doc Medich, and uh, the place just erupted. It was... Uh, it was a great moment in sports, and uh, certainly a, a highlight of, of that particular season. Well, we will move on from that uh, wonderful relationship you had with Frank Robinson. And to, talk radio. And, and talk radio to much, much more as we return after a short break. Landerhaven was created for that special moment in people's lives and that special moment is a wedding reception. From the concept to the decorations to the entrance down the staircase, creating the magic with great service, fine wine and food, an elegant wedding cake, beautiful grounds and gardens, unforgettable images. For a wedding reception you'll always remember, executive caterers at Landerhaven. Is it getting so frustrating at your office that it's harder and harder and harder to get any work done? You need services you can count on, starting with Business Class Phone from Time Warner Cable Business Class. Get Business Class Phone and receive up to six months free internet or cable TV. 
Why put up with more frustrations than you have to? Enjoy our reliable solutions. Get business class phone and receive up to six months free internet or cable TV. Time Warner Cable Business Class. You live in Ohio, you work in Ohio. And when you have questions about your health insurance, you like talking with someone who's right here in Ohio. That's why you carry the Medical Mutual card. Our card comes with the best customer service anywhere. More than 2,700 dedicated employees are right here in Ohio. It's our job to take care of your health care needs so you can focus on what's most important, getting well. Medical Mutual, the official health insurer of the Cleveland Indians, Cavaliers, and Browns. Hi, I'm John Salante, and I live in Brunswick, Ohio. WBIZ is our source for entertainment, masterpiece theater, great performances, programs such as Applause that bring us weekly a look at the different performers in the area. WBIZ has enhanced our lives. It is an opportunity brought into, the, you know, into our home to watch something that we never had before, to bring the community itself directly to your home. For a wedding reception you'll always remember, executive caterers at Landerhaven. To put his plan in motion, Maletti had to find a coach. The coach had to find players. And then, of course, somebody had to call the action. Here comes Monroe out of the backcourt. On the right wing against Bobby Smith. Around to the circle, 15-footer, no good. Rebound, Fraser. Fraser right side, bingo, stole the ball! Bingo down the sideline, left side, stops, Roberson, got it! Roberson scores, and it is 111-105. Welcome back, everybody, to the Corporate Club here at Landerhaven. John Tellich, along with Joe Tate and Terry Pluto. We were talking in our, our first segment about the early stages of Joe's career. He's uh, written an outstanding book, a great read. Terry Pluto, of course, uh, did uh, the heavy lifting, as it were. And uh, it's fun uh, piece of, of, of uh, history, sports history here in Cleveland for Joe to recount uh, his career and instances along uh, the way. Uh, a lot of favorite players. I know when I spoke with you for an interview for Fox 8, you mentioned Z. And Z is now uh, back in the fold. That's kind of great to see, isn't it? Yes, it, uh, it, it's good for the Cavs organization to do that for him. And whatever they assign Z to do, I know he'll approach it with the same vigor he approached everything else he did for the Cavaliers. And obviously he's not doing it per se for the money. He made a great deal of money in his career for the Cavaliers. Uh, but yet you see there's, there's ways that he can be a contributing factor to this job. He's just not window dressing, correct? What, whatever, whatever they ask him to do, if he doesn't immediately know how to do it, he'll learn how to do it in a hurry. Now, I think it's a good hire, a good hire. You also mentioned uh, uh, when we were talking about Danny Ferry, how much you were fond of Danny, because he came in here in some difficult circumstances back early in his career. Danny Ferry came to the Cavaliers in the Ron Harper deal, which uh, again put him on the negative side of the ledger and then did not get to play very much. But to Danny's credit, he had a lot of money that he was lugging around. And rather than just sit there and mope about it or just sit there, period, he'd come down to first the Coliseum and then to the queue and uh, with his fiance, who later became his wife, which tells you a lot about her, that she would go down there and rebound the ball, <laughs> pass him the ball at odd hours of the day and night. And he kept working and working and working on his game, strengthening his knees. And he, uh, when called upon a couple of three seasons into his career, uh, put together a really good season for the Cavaliers and uh, played well the rest of the time in Cleveland and went down to San Antonio and collected a couple of rings and uh, is still a viable part of the San Antonio organization. So, yeah, Z and, and Danny Perry were my favorite Cavaliers. I'm kind of uh, jumping back a whole bunch of years to the days when AC played for the Cavs. How great could he have been had he had a nice set of knees without uh, the surgeon's knife invading him every once in a while? Boy, that is the truth. Uh, Austin Carr uh, could have set numbers. They are still trying to catch 
had he remained healthy. But he, too, had to battle through a lot of injuries and still managed to put together a, an outstanding career for the Cavaliers. And I, I still haven't gotten over the first time I saw him in a Dallas uniform. I just <laughs> couldn't cope with it. it uh, it was just totally unreal, but AC was definitely one of the all-time great Cavaliers. In the book, you allude to Nate Thurman. Can you uh, help our folks out who perhaps are watching this at home, or obviously our friends here at uh, Executive K uh, the Executive uh, Club here, and talk about Nate Thurman? What uh, was a special story about he and, and his father? Well, Nate Thurman came to the Cavaliers from Chicago in the twilight of a great career. First thing he did was bring order out of chaos. We were off to a very poor start, and uh, he realized what Bill was trying to do. He bought into it. He became kind of the ranch foreman for Bill, and that in itself got us aimed in the right direction. He could only play 15, 20 minutes a night, but he played uh, with great vigor when he did play. But as far as my personal involvement is concerned, uh, my father, who had a long, hard time dealing with the fact I was going into sports casting because he really didn't think maybe that was uh, a good way to make a living, uh, he came in from the farm uh, to Chicago and Bill Fitch gave him a pass to ride on the bus with us down to the games with the Bulls. So we got a chance to see what I was doing up close and in person. And the thing that really was most impressive was the fact that he met all of the Cavalier players and in particular met Nate Thurman. And Nate, Nate Thurman was a very imposing looking guy to begin with. And uh, my father had, I think the best way to put it, very limited association with uh, African American people. I, there weren't any out where we lived on the farm and he never worked with any in Chicago and so he probably had a lot of preconceived ideas. And uh, the next thing I knew in the lobby, first time we were together, is Nate's over there sitting down talking to my dad. And they're having a very involved conversation. When they get on the bus, why, my dad goes back and sits with Nate. And they're still talking all the way down to the game. And at the uh, second visit, why, again, Nate came down into the lobby. He saw my dad across the way. And, Mr. Tate, how are you? Good to see you. Came right over. He was a fan for life because uh, dad thought that was tremendous that Nate Thurman would remember him from the previous get-together. And uh, they, they really, uh, I can't say they were hard, fast friends because they only saw each other about four or five times, but it did wonders for race relations in the Tate family <laughs> because dad realized there was a lot more uh, to Nate Thurman than just a big guy playing basketball. The, you know, the interesting thing on that also was that Joe's dad wouldn't know Nate Thurman from anybody else. He, he cared less about sports. He thought sports were stupid. So it's not like he gravitated to Nate because he's this great center. I mean, as far as he known, he could have been a tall elevator operator. He had no idea. But they connected on this human level, and um, Joe really had to buck uh, kind of his dad's will about going to sports casting because his dad just really thought it was stupid. And at one point, you know, Joe recalled a story to me where his dad sent him to a psychologist because Joe was always up in his room playing like a, a baseball game and doing the broadcasting himself. And, and Mr. Tate was a little nervous about all that was happening with my son. My son's talking to, the, <laughs> yes. to no one. <laughs> <laughs> Great training for later in life. <laughs> loudly, loudly. Yeah. And recording it. Yes. <laughs> but what young sportscaster didn't do that type of thing? I mean, I think we all can remember, at least those of us that are in the business, that you did. You watched games and you did your own broadcast of, of it and had, had a great time with it, a lot of fun with it as well. And over the years, the, the, the talent level of guys that you saw while you were sitting up in the Joe Tate perch, as it were, uh, at the queue or previous to that, of course, at the Coliseum, fantastic. I mean, and, and the best athlete, obviously, was LeBron James. What was it like doing games with LeBron James? Well, I, too, carried all of the hopes and dreams uh, when LeBron became a Cavalier and... Uh, you know, he, uh, he gave us a lot of great nights of basketball, no doubt about it. But uh, 
I think the one thing uh, that I came away realizing is he, he didn't have any leadership capabilities and he had to be a leader on that ball club and he couldn't deal with that. So he had great games, no doubt about it, but could not lead the ball club the way they had hoped that he would. And when at the end, I think he came to the realization this just wasn't going to work out for him. And uh, we had a couple of uh, late playoff instances where I think he really did give up. And then we had the wonderful television extravaganza in which he told the world that he had just decided this morning while he was eating his Fruity Pebbles. <laughs> uh, I know it was Fruity Pebbles because he ate Fruity Pebbles all the time. <laughs> and uh, he had just decided that morning to go to Miami. And I think it was at that point that I threw up. <laughs> <laughs> Because I, you didn't buy that. I am well aware of the fact that those guys put that together a couple of years before when they were all on the Olympics, and that was just waiting for the time to get it done. So they're down in Miami, and uh, you move on. Uh, I would certainly stress to one and all, though, that uh, his loss was a great loss, but it, it does not necessarily mean the Cavaliers are going to be uh, in the doldrums for the rest of their. Uh, corporate lives because I think uh, much better days are ahead for the Cavaliers. You can start right with a coach, Byron Scott, who I think is a tremendous coach. In fact, that's one of the few things that I can honestly say I wish I could have come back for was just to be with him because right. I watched him coach last year uh, on TV uh, from the hospital bed and I thought the way he you know, you never really see how good a coach is, and Terry can, can tell you this, you never really see how good a coach is until you see him deal with adversity, until he is faced with as much n negativism as you could possibly muster, and boy, that last Cavalier team had a <laughs> lot of negativism, and Byron Scott came through it like a champ, and now you're gonna give him some talent, I guarantee you he'll give you a winner. Well, and he took the job, Joe, not really knowing the whole, even though sure. we all come back now to realize that probably the die was already cast with LeBron and D. Wade and what have you, but he didn't know in his heart of hearts which way it was going to go. I mean, so he, to his credit, he took that job with the possibility of it being what we saw last year, Yep. where you didn't have much talent, LeBron's gone, and now you're picking up the pieces. So you see a lot of... Uh, instances where this guy's going to build himself a very solid potential Hall of Fame career if he can turn this franchise around. He already was to the finals twice with the Nets, so he can do it. Yes, he can. Your thoughts? Oh, on Byron, I think that what I like about Byron Scott is he knows the average NBA coach lasts about three to five years with the team, then he's fired. And so along the line, Byron decided. I'm going to do the job my way, so when the three to five years is up and they fire me, I always walk out and know that I coached the best I could. I mean, this, this is the guy that took the Nets to back-to-back -to -back NBA Finals, and the following year after that, he was fired uh, because the players were quote, tired of him, you know. And I like that, especially with the younger team. He has a lot of structure and order. You could already see the impact on Kyrie Irving. Um, yeah, Irving's coming in with a lot of talent. Just as Jason Kidd did, just as Chris Paul did, but I think that having a coach that was a former NBA guard, I mean, you just look at Byron Scott, and you know he played in the league. He has that bearing about them. And I, that's why, you know, I'm excited. I've enjoyed watching them this year. I think they're a fun, endearing team. I'm not sure exactly how good they're going to be immediately. But, you know, Byron told me that he felt even if they had lost LeBron and they were going to take a big step backwards, that with Dan Gilbert as the owner, and he liked Chris Grant, he just felt that they would be able to put it back together again. And he liked building teams. What do you think about just in general the talent level that Kyrie Irving has and potentially can he be one of the best point guards in the league? I'm asking you this because Joe has said he's retired and he's not specifically sitting down every night and, and you know, grading these guys on a point-by-point -point basis. Well, let's see, he played 11 games at Duke and 13 for the Cavaliers. That's his extensive experience <laughs> after high school. 
and he's averaging like 19 points a game in January. So think about that for a moment. And you look at, I remember, I want to, by the way, I hope nobody in this room were among those, I'd say about a dozen emailers after he had that bad first game that I got, how the Cavs are morons, and how could this guy, how could they take this guy, the number one pick, he's terrible. You know, I wrote back, well, you know, he's 19, his first pro game. I guess maybe the first day you walked into your job, you were a knockout, but I sure wasn't. I still remember I was working in Greensboro, North Carolina. I misspelled the name Necro and type about that big in a headline. And they probably were wondering the same thing. Why did they ever hire this guy? And, you know, it was basically a case of nerves. But I, very seldom do you see a young player who could go to the basket with either hand. You think in the NBA, Joe, didn't this drive you nuts too much? They can't make a left-handed layup. Three-fourths of the league can only make a layup with one hand. You know, part of the reason is they could just jump over the rim and dunk it. This guy makes shots with either hand. Um, he seems to have a lot of uh, already good respect from the older players. And you could tell he plays for Shostevsky at Duke, and he, he had a strong dad. You know, he's come in with some discipline. And, and some of the other players are fun, too. But, you know, in the league... If you could get a good point guard, I mean, that's, it's kind of like having a good starting pitching staff in baseball. I mean, that, that is a great start to respectability. Let me drop back into your wheelhouse, great point guards that you've dealt with over the years. Talk about Mark Price. He was really a special talent, wasn't he? Mark Price was indeed a special talent, uh, and uh, if he had not run into all the injuries he ran into, including one of the worst cheap shots I have ever seen in my life when Rick Mahorn came up behind him and drilled him with an elbow that the doctor said had it been two inches lower it would have killed him. Uh, you know, Mark Price really was part of, uh, it was, but as Terry has said about that team, he was part of the, the whole structure. You know, that team just fit together perfectly and they were coached by a man who was the absolute right guy for that basketball team. That, that was really fun to watch, and Price was a big part of it. Byron Scott, a lot of fun to be around him now and see how he's leading the team. Getting back to Joe and your analogy with, with Lenny Wilkins, what made him a great coach? I mean, Hall of Famer, either way you look at it with this guy. Well, coach and player. Lenny Wilkins was, we got him first as a player at yeah. the end of his career, and uh, he really did give us an idea of what pro basketball was all about and certainly helped get some guys aimed in the right direction. I think Austin Carr would tell you that he had a great right. influence on him. And then uh, Lenny came back as coach, and he was one of the things that Byron is. He was steadfast, steady. What you got on Monday was what you're going to get on Tuesday, going to get on Wednesday. And uh, he also tempered himself for that particular team. Mm -hmm. and it, uh, you know, they couldn't, uh, a screamer yeller wouldn't have fit in well with that club, but Lenny Wilkins fit in perfectly with that team. He certainly did, and one of the defining moments in Cavaliers history, obviously the, the, uh, the shot by Michael Jordan. How was he after that, and, and how was the team after that, that, that particular day? Well, you know, it was like, uh, it was just everybody shut off the sound, and it was very quiet in there. <laughs> and uh, I think the, the team psychologically overcame that. I don't think it had a long-term mark on their psyches. But then the injuries started to pile up. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and people don't realize this, but Michael Jordan took six game-winning shots at the Cavaliers in the time that he played Cleveland. Only three of them went in. But it was that one of the three that people will never forget. Yeah, one of the most defining moments, and and obviously in sports history, you see the networks always showing that uh, come playoff time. But it made his career. He thus went on and obviously established himself as a as a Hall of Fame talent. But uh, in all that, you still got Elo hanging and trying to trying to block that well, shot. I said it didn't affect their psyches. I think it did bother Elo because he's had to look at that <laughs> on TV six million times since it happened. Although then that one commercial came out where Jordan misses the shot and uh, Elo said he saw it, 
and he just stared at the TV and then he fell right off the couch onto the floor because he, he thought he was in the twilight zone. <laughs> He was just in the land of computer generation, yeah, which right. uh, sometimes today is kind of hard to, there's a big blurring there between fact and, uh, and also uh, fiction. Uh, we'll continue along here with a great discussion with Terry Pluto of the Cleveland Plain Dealer and with Hall of Fame broadcaster Joe Tate here at the Executive Club at Landerhaven. We're going to be back in just a short bit. Wedding reception you'll always remember. Executive caterers at Landerhaven. Is it getting so frustrating at your office that it's harder and harder and harder to get any work done? You need services you can count on, starting with Business Class Phone from Time Warner Cable Business Class. Get Business Class Phone and receive up to six months free internet or cable TV. Why put up with more frustrations than you have to? Enjoy our reliable solutions. Get Business Class Phone and receive up to six months free internet or cable TV. Time Warner Cable Business Class. You live in Ohio, you work in Ohio. And when you have questions about your health insurance, you like talking with someone who's right here in Ohio. That's why you carry the Medical Mutual card. Our card comes with the best customer service anywhere. More than 2,700 dedicated employees are right here in Ohio. It's our job to take care of your health care needs so you can focus on what's most important, getting well. Medical Mutual, the official health insurer of the Cleveland Indians, Cavaliers, and Browns. You've seen their faces at the Executive Caters Corporate Club at Landerhaven. They've talked about business, politics, the economy, healthcare, sports, and education. As a 2012 sponsor, you'll be identified with a monthly television show airing on Time Warner Cable. Your company will receive exposure in broadcast, print, and electronic advertising. Season table discounts are available. For information, call Executive Caters at Landerhaven, 440-449-0700. Landerhaven was created for that special moment in people's lives, and that special moment is a wedding reception. From the concept to the decorations to the entrance down the staircase, creating the magic with great service, fine wine and food, an elegant wedding cake, beautiful grounds and gardens, unforgettable images. For a wedding reception you'll always remember, Executive Caterers at Landerhaven. Welcome back to Executive Caterers Corporate Club here at Landerhaven. John Tellich from Fox 8, Hall of Fame broadcaster Joe Tate, and Terry Pluto of the Cleveland Plain Dealer. Great book that they collaborated on, and uh, it's a fun read, and if you get the opportunity, pick it up and uh, enjoy. Many, many great stories. Uh, obviously an outstanding career that Joe has enjoyed uh, behind the microphone. Joe, the, the whole aspect of painting a picture and doing a game by yourself, it isn't done that often. And why did it suit you and was it difficult like when you, you were doing Indians games on TV and you worked with Bruce and was that difficult? I'm not sure we could bear working with Bruce with anything else <laughs> that I've done in that's my life. That's another show. But that's another show. Anyway, uh, no, I think in basketball, uh, one guy can handle it very nicely because uh, the other guy just has a tendency to get in the way unless he's smart enough to just sit back and wait for his moments to uh, interject things into the broadcast. And uh, yeah, when when I came into the league, there were one one guy broadcast crews everywhere. Now there are fewer and fewer. I guess they 
have all these ex-basketball players wandering around with nothing to do and so and they jobs. insert them into the uh, radio broadcast crews. Then they take the broadcast crews and put them in parts of the arena that no one can see anyway, <laughs> including the guys trying to do the game. But, but you like, to be, you like to be show. up there. You, why is that? A lot of guys are down on the floor. But you like I to know. They, uh, yeah, some guys like the ambiance oh. of uh, the, yeah, who needs that? like to see the sweat but flying. I, I like to be up so I can see the game. I mean, how can you call the game if you can't see the game and all of the game? So therefore, that's why I like to be up. And uh, they were nice enough to accommodate me uh, at the queue after we had been out there at the Coliseum. Uh, uh, Bob Price put me up there years ago at my request, and yes. I was glad to see it carry on downtown. We well, you know John, Joe's favorite coach in that regard, having to do with vision, was Mike Fratello, because he's like short. And when you always complained about, I did that whole game staring at Paul Silas's backside. Cause remember <laughs> those, and that is actually what would happen down on the floor sometime, because once upon a time we were there before we were sent up to the ceiling to, to cover games. And it just seemed like no matter where you would kind of look, a referee or a coach would sit, uh, stand right in front of you. It was cool to kind of see some plays, but then a lot of times uh, you just kind of saw them. So that's. I remember when Joe moved up, I went up and watched some games from up there, and I actually, I began to like it from up there, too, uh, because of the ability, really, to see what's all, you kind of see the whole thing developing. Yeah, it should be his uh, producer up there, that, you know, you know, you'd have the seat there each and every night, that would have been kind of a, a good deal. But you had your radio, uh, you had your uh, columns that you had to write, and hence, we have some questions from the audience, and we will just point here to uh, this gentleman in the back. Uh, please uh, state your question to Joe or Terry. Uh, uh, this is for Joe. Uh, my name is Will Robinson. I'm a retired banker without a golden parachute, unfortunately. Uh, Joe, I was wondering uh, your evaluation and opinion of the owners you worked for, especially the guns and Dan Gilbert. Well, I, the guns and I had a very good relationship, Gordon in particular, because as he told me when he bought the team and brought me back, he said, you are going to be my eyes. I am, he was blind and he said, I'm going to try and see the game through your play-by-play. -play. And I always kept that in mind and that's why you'll, you might have noticed that at times I would even describe the colors of the uh, floor. I, if they had special patterns on the floor, try, really try to create a visual picture for Gordon and then Others like Kathleen Thompson and, and others would come to me and say, you know, I, I'm blind, but I can see the game through your broadcast. No greater compliment than, uh, than that. But the guns treated me very well. I enjoyed working with them. Uh, as far as Dan Gilbert, I think he is the perfect guy to be an owner in professional sports today. A guy that you know, when necessary or even when not necessary, <laughs> will shoot from the hip, say what's on his mind, and uh, I think that uh, he, is, he is a guy that is just the perfect guy to run pro sports, and he's got, what now, four teams that yeah. he's got, three, yeah. four teams? Got so uh, I, th I think he's a real plus factor. What did you think of his, real, to stay on the same track, his response to LeBron's thing that night when he did the very heated email? I loved it. <laughs> I loved it. They took his 50,000. They didn't take mine. So, uh, but I did. I, I, think, I think that gave a lot of people the understanding this guy was in it, you know, and uh, in it to win it. And if somebody did him dirty, he was going to let him know about it. Yeah, good guy to have on your side. Yep. Go ahead. Is that Mike Moran? Basketball coach of John Carroll, Mike Moran. Um, two things. First of all, excluding John Telich, uh, your opinion, the best commentators around now. And then secondly, Joe, uh, since it's uh, not football season, you like small colleges. And uh, I know you're, in football you have a favoritism towards Mount Union. Would you consider doing a John Carroll game during the basketball <laughs> season? <laughs> <laughs> You, you guys keep beating uh, Mount Union in basketball. I, Mike, I, I got a bad feeling about you there. If you drop about <laughs> five or six straight to the uh, Purple Rangers, I'll feel a lot more favorably disposed. <laughs>
But this one game I'm doing at WEOL is a one-shot. It's a make good, and I don't intend <laughs> to continue on a regular basis. And you know, my wife, Jean, sitting out there, every time she hears me say that, she says, oh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> And what about who's your favorite, uh, he said, it's like sports broadcaster in the area, would you say, which one? Well, I think Tom Hamilton does a fabulous baseball job. I really enjoy, I'll dial up Tom and yeah. listen to him, uh, even though I don't even know the, the players he's talking about. I just think he does a great job. And, uh, you know, it, uh, he would have to be number one on my hit parade here. And uh, the guy I'm going to be working with at WALL, uh, Tim Elcorn, I think is a, is a great play-by-play -play announcer. But there's the thing, you know, Tim has just never been at the right place at the right time yeah. to move up the ladder, and it's too bad because uh, he could do a good job at a much higher level. I agree with you on that. We have a question back here, folks. Hi, Steve Smiley. Uh, question, when you look up in the rafters today and you see all those uh, retired jerseys, I think you've earned the right, after all these years, to pick your one favorite player that's not up there that you'd like to see retired. Oh. Without doubt, and I argued with Wayne Embry about this till we both turned a pale shade of blue, and that was World Be Free. Oh, yeah. World Be Free should have had his number retired because he single-handedly brought the franchise out of the Ted Stepien morass and <laughs> uh, kept interest alive in basketball in the time that he was here, averaged 22 points a ball game and was really Jack Armstrong, the All-American boy, while he was here. What he did in other franchises, don't know, don't care. I just know that here, he did everything necessary to get his name and number up there in the rafters. Joe, I would ask you about that individual who you just mentioned, but I think we'll just keep the program moving along here. We, yeah, we'll just, we won't go, go on that hey, uh, short little chapter. Go right ahead. Uh, Joe and Terry, I wanted to ask you about the 07 Eastern Finals. Um, it was a very close series throughout, and game six was another of those games, and then late third, early fourth quarter, Daniel Gibson hits about five threes in a row, and the place goes crazy. It looks like we're going to win. What's going through your mind at that time? What, they, when Booby went crazy and, and got 30, he got 33 in that yeah. game, didn't he? Yeah. And I, that was when I said the Detroit Pistons just got booby trapped. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah they did. But, uh, you know, I can't say that I'm sitting there thinking, oh boy, we're going to the finals or anything like that. I'm just doing the game. Now, when it's over, I may say, well, how many sets of underwear am I going to have to pack mm -hmm. to go to San Antonio? But uh, during the course of the game, I really don't. Don't think about it. What struck me then is I remember when uh, LeBron was playing at St. Vincent St. Mary, and some of their biggest wins came when LeBron was throwing the ball to Drew Joyce the yeah. third, <laughs> another little pint-sized guard making shots from a long way off. And that's what happened in that game. So I kind of like that part of it. And I always like it when in a big game, there's an unlikely hero. I remember one of the Bulls' big championship games was one, uh, I thought it was game six or game seven, Steve Kerr made a shot yeah. at the buzzer. So to me, I, from a, you know, kind of a purist fan kind of thing, I like when you just see somebody who's the hero that you don't figure is going to be the hero. And where would you rank uh, LeBron's performance in the Palace at Auburn Hills when he went insanely just crazy at the end of that game. Didn't it was spectacular. Unbelievable that he, uh, that he played that way. I mean, he had the talent to do it, and he really put it all together in that particular game. He sure did. All right, do we have a question out this way? Go ahead. It's, it's two questions. The first question is, Joe, since, since you were firsthand, saw every game LeBron played in, uh, going into the Boston series, the last series that, uh, that he was here with us, Number one, did you expect the Cavs to win that series? And number two, can you go back to games five and six? And uh, you alluded to it in your initial discussion here, but do, do you think he just plain did quit? I and, think, and if he did, why? I think he realized Boston was playing at the top of their game. The Cavaliers weren't at the same level. And I, I think it had a negative effect on his basketball psyche. Now, whether you want to call that quitting or not, I don't know. I was, you have to be inside the man 
to to say quit, but uh, it certainly had an effect on him uh, at the end of that series. And then Joe and I, when we were doing the book, talked about that. And then, all right, if you think you just wanted to tank it and get out of Cleveland, but then you look at the last couple games of the Heat finals, it was the same thing. He disappeared. This guy, before you talked about game five against Detroit, who simply took that team on his back, took all those shots, from that guy in 07 to this guy you saw four years later, when really, you know, his game should be more mature and everything else, right. something was missing. Because, I mean, this, the stakes were high for him last year to prove he's a champion. Right. And so that's why, to just to say this simple thing, oh, he, he's a quitter, he wanted the Cavs to lose, and he was out of there and didn't care. Well, what happened in Miami? I don't have, by the way, I don't have an answer what happened in Miami, but because they're, Dwayne Wade and those guys are going, what happened in Miami? And frankly, those of us in Cleveland say, we just saw this, and you made fun of us when we talked about it. Well, how do you like it? He got outplayed by a better talent in Dirk Nowitzki. That's one of the things that happened. I yeah, mean, that but he guy, stopped shooting that, the ball, John. I mean, that, that, he was Dirk, a, it's almost like you're afraid to make a mistake. Yeah, he did, he did stop shooting. Harlan, yes, sir. John? I want to thank you for being here. Terry, it's always nice to have you here. Joe, I want to thank you for a lifetime of friendship, of enjoyment. You were and are a legend in this city. You have given us great pleasure. Personally, it's been an honor to be your friend. And thank you so much. God bless you. God bless you all. Good luck to you, Joe. Thank you. Thank you very much. And ladies and gentlemen, that is a perfect way to end uh, our program today. Thank you very much to Hall of Fame broadcaster Joe Tate. Thank you to columnist and prolific author. As I said, there will be a book about this luncheon <laughs> coming out in about 10 minutes. Terry Pluto of The Plain Dealer and the great folks here at the Executive Caterers Corporate Club at Lander Haven. Thank you for your hospitality. And to those of you in the audience, thanks for taking part. Everybody have a great, great day. Please join us on Tuesday, February 21st, as Executive Caterers Corporate Club at Lander Haven looks at the upcoming Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductions in Cleveland set for April. News Channel 5 anchor Lee Jordan will interview Terry Stewart, CEO of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and Museum in Cleveland, and Joel Perisman, CEO of the Rock and Roll Foundation in New York, about the plans for that induction week. They'll also look at the role that the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and Museum plays in the Northeast Ohio economy. Corporate Club is brought to you by Executive Caterers, a special place for special occasions. Medical Mutual of Ohio, Ohio's Get Well card, offering health plans for life. Time Warner Business Class, making more of every minute with the speed you need. Inside Business Magazine, your source for business in Northeastern Ohio. Fox 8 WJW Television, 90.3 Idea Stream, the all day brain food. ALG Computer, Consulting and Training, Signs PDQ, Professional, Dependable Quality, and Jones for Printing Services. Supporting sponsorships are brought to you by the Greater Cleveland Partnership, a catalyst for change, Northern Ohio Chambers of Commerce. A portion of the proceeds of the Corporate Club at Landerhaven benefits Junior Achievement of Greater Cleveland. Vanderhaven was created for that special moment in people's lives, and that special moment is a wedding reception.
From the concept to the decorations to the entrance down the staircase, creating the magic with great service, fine wine and food, an elegant wedding cake, beautiful grounds and gardens, unforgettable images. For a wedding reception you'll always remember, Executive Caterers at Landerhaven. Is it getting so frustrating at your office that it's harder and harder and harder to get any work done? You need services you can count on, starting with Business Class Phone from Time Warner Cable Business Class. Get Business Class Phone and receive up to six months free internet or cable TV. Why put up with more frustrations than you have to? Enjoy our reliable solutions. Get Business Class Phone and receive up to six months free internet or cable TV. Time Warner Cable Business Class.